morning, everyone. If you guys can take your seats, welcome to Hillier Christian Assembly. Um, we do not have a lot of announcements today, but we would like to shout out those of you at home and ask for prayers for some of our brothers and sisters who are out today. We are going to kind of change it up today, if you guys don't mind standing for the reading of 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. I'll give you guys a chance if you guys want to open up your Bibles to follow along. They will not be posted. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without praying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be burdened to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you to ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not because at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Okay, please continue to stand for our worship team. Praise to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our King, to Him we will sing. In His great mercy He has given us life, and so we are called the children of God. children we've been redeemed we've been forgiven we are the sons and the daughters of our god we are the saints we are the 
children, we've been redeemed, we've been forgiven, we are the sons and the daughters of our God. We are the saints, we are the children, we've been redeemed, we've been forgiven, we are the sons and the daughters of children we've been redeemed we've been forgiven we are the sons and the daughters of our god and all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy Every day. 
Lord, we thank you this morning that you have made us your children. And Lord, that as our Father, you are more than we could ever possibly need. Lord, you are sovereign over all. You have created the universe. You have created us. And Lord, everything we need, we can find in you. Lord, we pray that you would focus us on that. Keep us from being distracted by wants of the world around us. And Lord, help us to just focus on what we truly need and find only in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's have some prayer before we get started in the, oops. Wow. Every time, every time. Anytime there's more than one working part, moving part, then, okay, how about that? Is that better? Okay, good. All right, let's have some prayer as we, uh, as we go into 2 Thessalonians this morning. Jesus, Lord, we, we love you for the words that you have to speak to us. You communicate to all of our hearts your glorious reality. And we're looking forward to that again this morning. As we get close to the end of this letter, things seem to be winding down but they're really just speaking to us where, where we're at. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is present and working inside of every one of us as we open our hearts to listen to you, to listen to your word, and to obey you. And I pray for the grace to submit to your divine truth for me and for all of us. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, have you ever heard of that saying, uh, so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good? Okay. Uh, well, you can never say that about the apostles, especially the apostle Paul. You know, you, you look at the letters that he wrote and Paul always, or at least more likely than not, follows the same structure every time he writes. There's a salutation, and then, boom, he lays out a huge view of everything according to the gospel. For instance, when you read the book of Romans, you know what you find in Romans, the first three chapters of Romans, you know what Paul is doing? He's telling you what's wrong with the whole world. Three chapters, mostly, just tells you what's wrong with the whole world. And you know, it's not that there's something wrong with this people and that people in this country and that system. The problem is you. You have something in you called sin. And then within those three chapters, he also shows what God has done to solve it. And he talks about the cross of Christ and how that each individual must believe in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by Him. And that's the big, big truth in the first three chapters. And then Paul goes to work and begins to carve down to a fine point as if in inverted pyramid fashion. Like a guy that's doing one of these ice sculptures with a chainsaw. Have you ever seen that? A chainsaw and a blowtorch. And they take a big block of ice and they shape it into a mermaid. And you just don't know how did you get there. And that's what the apostles kind of do. They start off with this big, big view and work their way down to a fine point where they take all the heavenly reality and then tie it around your feet where you stand on the ground and make it imminently practical. 
And so Paul does this in, in Romans. You know, uh, he starts with, let me tell you what's wrong with the whole world. And then he ends up in Romans 16 telling us how that we should get along with one another in the church. Wow! He went from there to there. Incredible. In the book of Ephesians, Paul starts off with eternity, where God is, is planning and choosing. This is way back. And ends up in chapter 5 and chapter 6, talking about hus how husbands and wives ought to get along with each other, how they ought to relate. And kids and parents and parents and kids. Wow! From eternity to a normal married life. Incredible. In 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses in the first couple of chapters what really is spiritual anyway. And then he goes to work in that letter and begins to hack off all the weeds and everything else that pretend to be spirituality and end up in chapter 16. Now listen to this. He goes from what really is spiritual and ends up in chapter 16 talking about the, the, the um, arrangements that you need to make in order to make a financial contribution to the Lord's work. Starts off great, ends up just practical where you are standing right there on the ground. This shows that the apostles, the men who wrote these letters were under the control of the gospel at heart level, even in the most practical things of life. Extraordinary. Now, what do we find in 2 Thessalonians? We're in this little short epistle. It's only three chapters long, and we're going to finish it next weekend. Well, the first couple of chapters, really big. Paul talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth to destroy the systems of sin and deal with all the rebellious and to defeat the Antichrist. And at the end of the book, right here in the verses that we're covering, he deals with working. Working. Getting up, going to work. Basically living a productive life. Now why, oh why, would that be important to us? It's because the typical person dreams of escaping the mundane life of work. We dream of it, don't we? Oh, you daydream, oh how it would be so good if I just had it different. There's more than one reason why that the most popular days for calling off is a Friday or a Monday, right? Everybody just, I don't know, the stomach flu just likes Friday and Monday. <laughs> and even though, and I don't know if you've had this happen, but uh, even folks that do show up on a Friday or a Monday, they in some way, shape, or form let you know, I'm not feeling this. I'm not feeling it today. Uh, I'm just not into it today. In other words, they're letting you know today you're going to have to pull your weight and mine because I don't want to be here. These are the kind of attitudes that we often have. Work is unpleasant. That's why we call it work. You know, uh, it's amazing how that even we Christians, we tend to forget and we start looking for purpose in our secular employment or we start looking for fun or stimulation in our employment and we're disappointed when we don't find it. There's a reason why we tell our spouse, honey, I got to get up early and go into the office this morning for stimulation. We don't say that. We don't say, uh, I've got to stay late tonight at fun. We don't say this. It's work. We don't expect to find in that thing the things that we find in Christ. We just don't. All right, then why do we bother with it? 
Why work? Why waste your life in an office space? I think that we've, we've done this before. We've calculated how many hours the typical person spends in the workplace or at work if you work at home. And it's a phenomenal amount of your life. More than in any other place. And there are lots of reasons that we could trot out for working. I don't want this morning to be a philosophy of the workplace message, okay? We every now and then give those. I think the last one, Michael Taylor did a fine job back in February. He might have shared on that. And all of those reasons are true. There is a high level philosophy about work in the Bible. Second Thessalonians does not provide one of these high level philosophy places about work. Instead, it talks about a couple of really practical points. Why do we work? Number one, we need to pay our bills. And number two, keeps you out of trouble. Can you believe this? I'm going to prove it here in a minute, right? But listen, I need to pay my bills. Work is not a place for me pursuing some kind of passion. It's so that I can pay my bills. And also, so that I will remain productively focused and stay out of trouble. Sorry to sound condescending, but this is true. We'll get into this in a second here. I'm going to take you right now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Where Paul gets serious and reminds them, he says, Now we command you, brothers, no suggestion here, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in case you forgot, Paul saying, I am speaking of heavenly and divine realities. I'm reminding you. And I'm going to take this down and I'm going to tie it around your ankles. What I'm about to say. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is that superior spiritual reality, the person of Christ. And he says, I command you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. Strange. But anybody that makes a life of avoiding productivity needs to be avoided. Now this doesn't mean that we Avoid someone who are, is unemployed or between jobs and looking. You know, we don't stay away from that saint. But we avoid those who are unproductive. And they've sort of made a life out of it. They made a habit out of it. This kind of life is not attached to the gospel. And we're looking, listen, all about, you know what discipleship really is? A follower of Jesus means I take spiritual reality and it somehow controls my living and ethical relationships and every other, my money, how I spend my free time, my marriage, everything, including my work and what I do. Idleness is an invitation for sin to emerge. Now let me appeal to your own experience. Have you ever felt that where all of a sudden you've got three hours of unoccupied, unscheduled time and it just opened up? And at first you're stunned. You kind of, then you sort of walk around in a semi-daze in the house and you think of, uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll read a book, and maybe I'll do this, and maybe I'll do And finally, what will happen is sin starts to emerge very slowly, like a hermit crab. You know, they ease out of the shell, and those two weird eyes look around. <laughs> Nobody around, no expectations, nothing scheduled. God help you if you're online and you realize, hey, I got three extra hours. And then you're, you're, 
what happens is that sin slowly emerges. It says, oh, this feels good. This feels good. This is kind of how it works. This is how idleness works. You think about the people who are independently wealthy. Now, not all the wealthy, because people who have really worked hard to earn it continue to be productive people. You know, they may fly, they may fly to their work in a helicopter, but they still go to work. You know why? So they can make more money or so they can keep their money. In other words, they remain productive. But now I would like to talk about the folks that suddenly got wealthy. You know, they went to Speedway, and while they were buying a pack of cigs, they also got some, you know, a couple of lottery tickets. And, oh, $500,000, I won $2 million, something like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, the crab came out, and they, they find themselves going into work, and they quit work. And, of course, they make a big show out of that. Next day, they quit their job. And then from the, the, the place that they quit, they take a ride over to the, you know, the Corvette dealership. And then from there, they're going to go talk to the realtor. In other words, they, they, uh, just, this is what happens. It's like a default living where all of a sudden all this idleness is rushing in to fill a gap. Work really means a necessary focus. It is accountability. It is productivity. There are issues of submission when you work. In other words, I gotta listen to somebody. More than likely, I am not the boss. I gotta listen. And I gotta get along with people. And this works even if you're at home raising kids. That's another kind of job. That's a full-time job plus. Now you're a referee all day long. If you've got several of them, or you're a teacher, or you're a disciplinarian, or whatever you are, and you've got to just manage this thing all day long, and at the end of the day, guess what? It's not over because it's not over till they go to bed, they go to sleep, and then you fall into your bed thoroughly comatose. Being productively invested over a very long period of time restrains sin doesn't give it any time to come out. That's why we want our kids kind of busy. Now, the secret is to keep them busy without busying yourself to death, right? We want to find something. Hey, I, hey, Junior, look, I got a 10,000-piece puzzle. You can work on it. Or, you know, th this is the kind of thing we, we hope there's a secret. We can find it because we know Sin comes when there's not anything productive being done. There's, there's more than one reason why that God gave one day a week for Sabbath. <laughs> not two, not three. Because, I, I don't know, I don't know all the ins and outs of Sabbath here, but God must have, he, he must have known that, uh, okay, their first 24 hours will be just recovering from the previous week. And right before sin sets in, uh, they got to go back to work again. So it's like, it's like a perfect arrangement here. So this is why Paul is giving a command unto productivity, stay away from idleness. You know what? Idleness is terribly attractive. We love watching TV shows about people that suddenly got rich. Oh, the things they got to do and things I dream about. And, uh, it's very attractive, and especially if that pattern get, breaks loose in the church. We are all quite affected by it, and Paul was very concerned about that. Okay, in verse 7, he continues. Here's the reason why, that he gives this command in verse 6, why he was so uh, bent upon reminding the believers, this is a command in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. Because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Now he's expanding the meaning, not just to being productive in a sort of generic sense, but he's talking about employment meant to put food on the table. 
We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we didn't have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. You see, Paul even said, he said, look, we, had, we have a right in God's eyes to be supported full time financially. We have a right. There's nothing at all wrong with it. In fact, uh, the Philippians supported the Apostle Paul's work. They were a robust bunch of believers that believed that they should put their money into the Lord's work. And where was the Lord working? Well, it's in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, so we'll just pass that on to him. So he was supported. In 1 Timothy, Paul did charge that those who are involved in in-church full-time ministry should be honored by financial support. So it wasn't that he was against that. So why didn't Paul use that right for himself in the city of Thessalonica? Why didn't he say, okay, look, I'm here serving full-time. You guys have to support me. Why didn't he do that? Well, for one thing, Paul may have looked around and observed a general culture of laziness and idleness. He may have. Like I had some friends that went away to, uh, went overseas to the mission field. This is back in the day. And they went to a certain country, which shall not be named, and uh, got there and found a whole generation of men who were working age were missing from the workplace. You know where they were? They were at home getting drunk. They just left it to the mom. They left it to the kids. You guys just kind of come up with whatever you want. Just keep me in booze. And I'll just be here. Paul may have looked around Thessalonica and seen that. And, and thought, uh-oh, oh no. We have to, as he said here provide you with, in ourselves with an example to imitate. So he may have needed to provide an example that way. Okay, secondly, uh, he pointed out we didn't want to be a burden to any of you. That was in verse 8. We don't want to be a burden to any of you guys because sometimes in a church, especially a brand new church with new believers, there just isn't the means. There's no way of doing it. Poverty can be a real factor here. And we've heard about in some of the believers in the churches in Macedonia, not too far from there, folks were really super poor. So Paul was very careful. You don't tell people who are almost not making it, hey, you need to, you know, ante up here. As a matter of fact, when we started our church back in 09, uh, for at least, what was it, a year a year and four months, I don't know, you were doing the books there, Jeff. Uh, I wasn't supported here. I was supported by another church. And we had to be really careful. We were watching our nickels and our dimes. And everybody in our church that started with us was super generous with their nickels and dimes. Because that's all they were making. That's all you were making. A lot of you hadn't even begun in any kind of serious Main, main line career job. You're, you know, I don't know, Speedway or wherever it was you were working. And I, I tell you what, everybody was anteing up with the dollar and with the 50 cents here and with the little bit there that we had. And God honored that. And then, he, then after a certain period of time, he started to turn loose the big time jobs. Because he honored that. Because you honored him. We had, uh, I remember our website back in the day. You might not remember this, but we had a really impressive website. It was one of these super basic, I think it was the bon uh, uh, economy. That's what, the economy websites from Homestead. It was like a, a, a template that cost us $4.99 a month, $4.99 a month. And uh, you only had enough bandwidth on there 
I think we still use that word back in the day. We only had enough bandwidth on the thing to put up one audio message at a time. And then you had to take it right down if you wanted to put up another one. <laughs> I mean, look at what we got now with all the bells and whistles and all this. But you, no way could you have equipment like we've got now and the, you know, the ability to reach out and, and things like this and expect that a first-year church was going to be able to afford it. So I was supported by another church and then a ministry up in uh, uh, Cleveland. And between those two things cobbled together, I was able to make it. And then slowly the Lord just did His work. It may just have been a matter of dollars and cents. And Paul says, look, I don't want to be a burden to you. Verse 10, it says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now this further expands the meaning of avoiding idleness into that of real, real employment that pays the bills. And Paul doesn't say here... Um, if anyone is not able to work, he said if anyone's not willing to work, there's a big difference here. Because if you're not able to work, that might mean that you're an orphan or you're a widow or you're somehow disabled in the church. And yeah, we should rise up and we should take care of that. But these guys, some of them are not willing to work. They're able-bodied and not willing Paul says, well, it's just really simple. He shouldn't eat. Those who don't eat quickly find a means of working. Now, Paul himself had two... Let me give you a little background here. All right. Paul had two levels of expertise. First of all, he had a graduate level education taught by the finest teacher of Judaism in the known world, and that was Gamaliel. Paul told us this in Acts chapter 22. He, says, I was, he said, I was learned at the feet of Gamaliel, and Gamaliel is still known today among serious Jews. Paul was there learning, right? That's where he went to grad school. That was his passion, you know? But what kept gyros on the table, or should I say heroes, on the table was not his superior training in Jerusalem. It was his uh, fallback profession. You could say his undergrad was tent making. I imagine that Paul's parents were a very pragmatic couple, just like a lot of parents in the ancient world. Here's a boy, I'm, you know, I'm fired up for God and this is what I want to do with my life. Okay, great. Like today, you know, your child may announce to you, I'm really interested in ancient Chinese musical instruments and I want that to be my profession. Okay, that's wonderful for a graduate degree. Let's talk about something a little more primary. Okay, we're going to, first of all, we're going to make sure you can pay your bills. <laughs> you can put some food on the table. And for Paul, that was tent making. Now, we know this from Acts chapter 18. Paul was a tent maker. Every son was guided into a primary occupation. A practical means of of putting food on their table. As a matter of fact, I found in um, Smith's Bible Dictionary, that's like an old school Bible Dictionary, they had an entry in there, interesting story. Uh, the, a sultan, fabulously wealthy in the ancient Middle East, the, the, the guy that's got the big palace and all the trappings. I mean, this is the size of his bedroom basically in here, right? Um, he had been trained in the art of carving wooden spoons. 
That means one of his parents figured out uh, one of these days the kingdom might all go away and all the gold gets stolen, but uh, kitchen utensils never go out of style. Someone will always need a spoon. So if you ask him, uh, oh, mighty sultan, could you show us how to make a spoon? You whoop out a block of wood and plane that thing down. Even that. So when Paul got involved in tent making, you know what that was in today's terms? That means he manufactured affordable mobile homes. That was Paul. It was a mar marketable skill. Highly needed in the outside world. You know, better than my primary skill. You know what I was trained with in the U.S. Army? Firing anti-aircraft missiles at enemy planes. Important skills for the outside world. At least that's what the recruiter told me. <laughs> anyway, just picking. But yeah, that, that was my primary skill. And eventually I had to get a primary in, um, not in Bible study. Like a lot of people get undergraduate degrees in Bible. Mine is in healthcare management, which means I can run your secretarial pool for a little more than minimum wage. I'm willing to do that. I can do that. So there's as always, all, you know, these kind of jobs, you want to make sure that there's always some kind of angle. And Paul had one of these. And his was highly in demand from city to city. People always needed a place. They always needed some kind of tents. He got apprenticed into that trade. Now, we don't know a whole lot about what that looked like when it was happening, but more than likely it just means he was a wet behind the ears kid that showed up at the site of the tent being made. And if you declare yourself an apprentice, that means, guess what? You're getting no money and you're getting to do all the work that no one else wants to do. Like, here, boy, carry that, carry that, uh, that shoulder load of materials over here and then cut that incredibly thick, stubborn fabric and get blisters between your hands and all this. Here, haul the ink, haul the dye or whatever it is. That's how he started, and it was enough to provide for his needs for the day. So probably he would start in the morning. Now in Thessalonica, he was there so short a time, more than likely he didn't have time to get vetted into a tent maker's guild or any kind of thing like that, nor did he have name rec uh, recognition. So uh, probably what he did was he would go around and, and do patchwork and things like this and small improvements to people's tents and he would get half in the morning and half in the evening when he got done and that was the daily work. That's what, probably what he was doing. And he made enough to provide for that day and to help support those who worked with him. Now, I would say that today, if you want to look at, okay, look at, um, look at uh, like an area like IT. You know, Greg Wyatt's in IT. Of course, unfortunately, he's at home today. He has to be. But uh, uh, I don't know. Brendan, you're in IT, right? Or some form of it? That's what, that's what they keep telling him. <laughs> they keep insisting. You know, it, it seems like there, there's always going to be a need for IT because there will always be men my age <laughs> that still have a system that's got a 4X CD-ROM in it. And, you know, it's still got the tray that comes out, the cup holder. You know the cup holder? Yeah. Yeah, the CD cup holder. And, and yet, you know, you always have guys like me, which means you will always need IT. Or law. Or medicine. You'll always need it. You might not be able to make all the money you make, but there will always be somebody that needs to be sued. Am I right there, uh, that? Okay, yeah. Somebody always needs to be sued or needs to be protected from being sued. Or you're a welder or you're an electrician or a handyman or a plumber. You, you, you kind of know there, the need for it is everywhere. So Paul, amongst these Thessalonians, modeled this kind of work. It was a bivocational kind of ministry. Now after having said all this, verse 11... 
It says, uh, we hear that some among you walk in idleness. This is what we heard. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. You know, some of these folks probably were very spiritual types. You can't tie their feet to the ground anywhere. And so they're always, well, the Lord led me here, and the Lord, the Lord spoke to me, and the Lord told me this, and God told me that, and, uh, and, and, and maybe even some of them had heard about Jesus coming back. And they'd said things like, well, I don't need to get a job. Jesus is coming back. He may come back tonight. That means I would waste a whole day looking for employment. I might not even need to pay tomorrow's bills. Hey, don't think that this is, uh, this is strange. I heard this kind of reasoning before. Back in the, like, 80s, where some said, I'm not going to go get my degree because the Lord's going to come back. I'm not going to go to college. And then even after they were in college and they'd gotten saved, they said, well, you know, the Lord's coming back. I'm not going to do my homework. I might not even need to do that theme paper. I'm not playing with you. These kind of things got said. Of course, the people that said them now are really regretting it because it's been decades and the Lord didn't come back and they still had to pay their bills. Paul says in verse 12, Now such persons we command and encourage and the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Verse 13, as for you brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Don't get tired, please. I know your job's not fun. I know it. I know it's not fun and you're not finding purpose in it and you feel like they don't appreciate you. Yes, don't grow weary. Don't give up. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and, having, and have nothing to do with him. Why? That he may be ashamed. Now, here he doesn't say excommunicate the guy or call him out. But just avoid him. And let the, the collective, sorry, but let the collective shaming of the faith community Speak to him. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. All right, you know what all this is? This is just another way of saying discipleship. I'm afraid that discipleship, that is showing people how to follow Jesus, only involves workbooks with fill-in-the-blanks and spiritual type things. And here's some teachings for you. Can you, give the seven, can you give the seven principles for which the Lord died on the cross? Can you name them off? Sin, sin, Satan. Okay, I, name all these things out. And if you can, that means you've been discipled. Paul said, no. Not only that. In fact, those things need to control your work life. This is discipleship. I think we think spirituality in its most effective experience is somehow something grandiose. I'm spiritual. God spoke to me. And we think of that. But listen, when, when Jesus came out in his public ministry in Mark chapter 6, you know what they said about him? They said, this is the carpenter. Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. People said, this is the carpenter. Where's this coming from? For years, he was quietly making tables and chairs. For years, he was planing doors for people. <laughs> Nothing phenomenal there at all. A man approached Martin Luther, the reformer, one day and said, uh, Sir, what might I do to serve God? 
And Luther said, well, what do you do for a living? The man said, well, I'm a shoemaker. So Martin Luther said, um, well, then make the best shoe that you can and charge a fair price. You know, Luther didn't tell him, well, you should quit your job and serve the Lord full time because you can only serve that way. He didn't say you should start a ministry. He didn't say you should make Christian shoes. I know what I would have said to the guy. I said, okay, use your job as a way of preaching the gospel. Well, first, you use your job as a way of paying your bills and staying out of trouble. All right? Then we can talk about preaching the gospel, right? But anyway... Luther could have said, well, you should preach to everyone who buys shoes from you. No. Do your job, do it well, and be fair to other people. You know, I, I've, um, over, over many years of time, I saw a lot of people got in, get involved in full-time vocational Christian service. They wanted to be involved in ministry. And some of this, unfortunately, was not the result of calling. It was more like I'm bored with this stupid, dead-end job. I'm tired of it. I want to get involved in something where I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm inspired from day to day. And then they got into ministry and found more of the same. In other words, you better be called if you quit. Because we found less money, <laughs> we found less appreciation, and unless you seriously compromised, you probably didn't become anything of note, except, of course, to God. We are not called to pursue romance. We're just told to be faithful. Feed your family and stay constructively focused. That's what you really need to do. I think, though, that we all dream of getting out of the rat race. We'd love to check out of it. You, you, you think, if, what if I had a rich uncle I didn't know about? I got a call today on the phone. I'd probably just sit on the information all day, wait for my spouse to get home. And then I'd break the, first of all, I wouldn't tell him. Say, let's go out to eat at the most expensive place in town. You know, you, you probably gamed all this stuff out. And then I'll break the news to them over a glass of champagne. We feel like, I just, you know, if I really want to be involved in the gospel, I need to be free. And no doubt some were thinking this in Thessalonica. I need to be free of this these lower things. i got to be free. But listen, if the gospel doesn't work in the most restrictive forms of life, it doesn't work at all. And a good number of verses are spoken to slaves in the time of the Roman Empire. The most at-risk group of people ever and the gospel could speak to them in the most restricted way of life. If it can't work there, it won't work for the rest of us. Thank God for a, a message so powerful that it liberates and it gives meaning regardless of what you do for a living. We found the blessing of it and blessed are you. I'm happy that you got a job. I'm even more happy that you got the gospel in that job. Let's have some prayer. Jesus, Lord, we, we thank you. Your, your word, your presence is everywhere with us. You bring meaning wherever you are. We thank you for this. Lord, we pray that we don't lose sight. Now, I pray that none of us lose sight of the, the life that we're currently living, full of responsibilities and pressures, but thank you, Lord, also full of Christ. 
And I pray that we stand firm in this reality. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us for our last song. Oh, how good it is when the family God dwells together in spirit, in faith and unity, where the bonds of peace, of acceptance and love are the fruit of his presence here among us. So if one of his people Oh how good it is on this journey we share to rejoice with the happy and weep with those who mourn for the for coming and joining us in worship and hearing the word today. We pray that you have an awesome week.